Yeah, so the protocol I introduced in the immunity code is food-based for the most part. Food-based, okay, so not taking pills. So, so the body's a tube, okay, and it starts here and it ends at the other end, and in, and in between there's just a big long tube. That's essentially the body. And so as that food is going through the whole tube, it's feeding the right bacteria where they need to be fed. Okay, that's a physical property that can't be replicated with pills. Joel Green, best-selling author and gut health expert. His new book, The Way Immunity Code Diet, revolutionizes weight loss by focusing on immunity. It's a sequel to his influential book, The Immunity Code, which sparked health trends like mouth taping and targeting gut health. This groundbreaking approach underscores the crucial role of immunity in our health. You know, we picked up a magazine and we took a, took a look at these you know, bodybuilding magazines or fitness magazines. In reality, we can't really relate to all, a lot of this. It doesn't really translate to the average person. Why do you think everybody was lying? A lot of it I just think had to do with commerce. Like there was the idea of like, you know, you could look like this if you just take this supplement. And that was never true. Many of us do not have a healthy gut. I mean, civilization is the problem. This whole era of quote unquote biohacking, it subconsciously acknowledges is that the problem is civilization. Well, there's there's three primary rhythms that nature has, three big buckets. One is light and dark, the other is hot and cold, and the other is dietary. Those are the three basic buckets of nature's rhythms. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Joel, welcome. It's a pleasure today to get to speak with you. Thanks, guys. It's uh, I'm happy to be here. You know, you've been in the fitness and nutrition world for decades, uh, witnessing countless trends come and go. So I want to kind of start off the question by asking you, what's the biggest misconception you've seen persist throughout your career? And why do you think it's been so hard to dispel? <laughs> well, you, sir, may have just asked the most important question in the history of important <laughs> fitness questions. This might be the one. Yeah, this might be it. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that it is, if you, if you um, kind of took a baby universe and in it you stuffed the movie Pumping Iron and then you stuffed the entire, you know, all the magazines published like, you know, between whatever, 1970 and 19 and 2020, whatever, you know, all the, all the fitness magazines. And then you took all the influencers and stuck all that in the same. And then you had this universe of what you call, you know, fitness. Um, the biggest misconception would be that, that all of that, like all of it has anything to do at all with real life. Mm -hmm. that's the single biggest misconception that that universe um, has anything to do with the life most people live or that even most of most of what's in there even translates to begin with um, right yeah but, and it's really that and it's um it, it's really amazing i mean we're, we're we're going on i don't know how many years how many decades this thing has been a thing and there's still that misconception that all of this stuff you're seeing um is number one, long-term going to make you healthier. And number two is even doable for most people. And that's, that's no small thing. I mean, that's, that's everything. That's quite a thing. So that, that is what I would say it is. That's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, it, it, it's true. And I think that, 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 that like seeps into many other aspects and facets uh, 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 of life as well. I mean, you know, we pick up a magazine and we took a, took a look at these you know, bodybuilding magazines or fitness magazines or watch the media. And when in reality, we can't really relate to all, a lot of this. It doesn't really translate to the average person. When we watch a, an actor who has a, a crazy extreme diet that they may have gone through or on the reverse, they put on 40 pounds of weight. But this kind of information is not really... Uh, probably uh, <laughs> useful to us when we're trying to apply that into our life. But was it always like this or is it becoming oh, yeah. less and less? It's always like this, but it's, yeah. I think right now it's more, I mean, it's more open and you can see the difference. It, it's, it, it, it's not anymore, you know, something magic, this fitness industry, the results and all this kind of stuff. It's more right now revealed to the public. In some ways. <clears throat> I mean, I think the, 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 the obvious one would be that steroids are out in the open now so people are 
more out, more forthcoming with respect to like you know taking taking substances that enhance the body. But that being said, there's still a few holdouts who you know just lie their butts off about it. But that part I think is is gotten better because when I was you know when I was like I don't know my early 30s, everybody lied. Everybody lied. Mm. Um, I think what's gotten worse though is the um, the gap between what the average person does with their time and what, you know, the people that are giving advice, generally speaking, do with their time. They're very, very different. And if you were to, if you were to create an equal playing field and you were to create the same set of conditions for both people, it would look very different. You know, it mm -hmm. would look incredibly different. And so I talked about this in my first book, which is that you're going to do, you're going to spend the majority of your day focusing on whatever your primary role in life is. That's where you're going to put your time. And so you always hear this. There's always this kind of hook that you see, which is, you know, my secret. I'm going to give you my secret. Here's my secrets, you know, press, press. I want it and I'll give you my secrets. <laughs> and I can tell you what the secret has always been. It's always been a bunch of time, like spending lots and lots of time every day working on, you know, uh, health and physique and then and then a whole lot of like uh, drugs behind the scene. I mean, that's really been the secret for the longest time. That's the truth. Why do you think everybody was lying? Um, well, back in the back in the day, you know, when when before biohacking and when it was mostly fitness, um, a lot of it, I just think, had to do with commerce. Like there was the idea of like, you know, you could look like this if you just take this supplement. And that was never true. That was always that was always just not true. Like when you when you look at what fitness models were doing, and like many of them have come out about it now and, and talked about it. That you know they were taking all kinds of steroids. Um, I think it was a lot of it was to create this illusion that um, you could do this too. You know, look what I did. You, could, I mean, that's the whole proposition, right? Look what I did. You can do it too, and that's a great proposition as long as you're honest about what you're doing. But I think as a consumer, if you kind of level up a little bit and you get a little more sophisticated and you realize, like, okay, uh, what could you do with what, what could you do with zero time in your schedule? That's what I want to know. Like, if I took all those hours and I put them down to, if I gave you two minutes every day and that's it, what could you do? What would you look like? That's a real question because that's what most people are in. That's the scenario most people are in um, over time. And if we took all of the, you know, all the substances out of it, what would you, what would your secret be then? So that, that's a much more real question. And, and the way you know that's true, I, I can give you an easy way to know that's true. Um, when Arnold ran for governor in California, okay, like the, the thing, the, the whole thing he sold to the masses, it didn't work for him. Like, right. like, like what, right. for example? Well, you know, that whole lifestyle, the whole Venice Beach lifestyle, all that stuff, you know, it didn't work for him when he was running for governor. I mean, that's when, you know, Arnold, he put on a lot of weight and, you know, <laughs> the way he solved that problem was he had to, was he had to stop being governor and go back to being an actor. That's how he solved it. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. You know, I, I want to talk, I, I know you have your second book out now, which is The Way the Immunity Code Died, which was published in 20, uh, what, well, very early 2024, let's say. And so this is really interesting because we've talked to a lot of, you know, fitness experts, nutritional experts. We've had the CEO of Beachbody, that's called now Body, come on this podcast. Uh, but this is, this, this is going to be a great conversation because I know you're really focused on an immune-centric approach approach to fat loss. Can you break down this concept for us, immune-centric approach to fat loss? How does this differ from a traditional approaches? Well, number one, it's more based on what really happens. So that's number one. And if you, if you start to break down like how things work in the body a little, a little more in depth, you're quickly going to run into the immune system, like rapidly. So the right. problem that is very prevalent is inflamed fat. Okay. 
like in obesity, you have inflamed fat. And so people who are obese with inflamed fat, it's very hard to lose weight. It's very hard to drop body fat. The reason is inflamed fat disrupts insulin function. So you get fat that's insulin resistant. So the question is, well, how do you fix that problem? And if you want to go to the core of fixing that problem, you have to go to the immune system. So example would be in an immune centric approach, fat loss does not begin with body fat. It begins in the gut. And the reason is, is that's where the immune system begins. So the immune system begins in the gut, specifically with what's known as the gut immune axis. And there are some readily identifiable um, uh, mug shots in that. <laughs> there is two bacteria that really stand out, the phytobacteria, that, the whole species, and in, and in particular, some key species in that, like Infantis, Bifidum, Brev. And then the, the gut lining bacteria, Acromantia mucinophila. And these two bacteria have a whole lot to do with the human immune system. And so when you look at the problem of inflamed fat and trace it back, what you find very often is that it kind of starts in the gut. And the way it works is when you have a lot of, let's say, bad bacteria in the gut, those bacteria are living and dying all the time. They're, they're breeding, living, dying, renewing. And when they die, their guts break open. And in the, in the cell wall of their guts, it's made up of what is essentially a toxin. As far as we're concerned, there's compounds in there with, with huge words, lipopolysaccharide and peptidoglycan, and all these big words. But the net of it to say is that these are toxic. And as soon as they hit the, as soon as they hit the gut lining, they open up the gut lining and go right through and they go into the bloodstream. And then they circulate and then they tend to lodge in body fat. And when they lodge in mm. body fat, they're what's known, there's another big word here, it's called immunoattractive. They tend to attract uh, immune cells because they are essentially an invader or like a toxin. Right. And they inflame the body fat. And not only that, they actually short circuit insulin working in body fat. Now, it's kind of not too many people really know this, but insulin is essential for body fat to work correctly because fat cells need insulin to power themselves. They need glucose. So when that whole system breaks and fat cells get insulin resistant, you're going to have a really, really hard time dropping body fat. You have to de-inflame your fat. And so in an immune centric approach, we, we kind of back up a little bit and we go, well, where do we start to fix this problem? And the answer is, well, let's first heal and seal the gut through these two bacteria, which have a lot of say in the immune system so that you're not leaking off this toxin that's hitting your body fat. So I would just say that an immune centric approach is a lot more dialed into how things actually work. Um, another really good example is post-workout. So if you look at post-workout, the goal becomes like recovery, right? Like you want right. to recover, right? You go into the gym, you know, you do some resistance and then the whole goal of everything is to recover and add some muscle, right? Well, that's all controlled by the immune system. So specifically, right after the gym, there are easily identifiable immune factors that drive everything. There are key signal mediators. So there's interleukin 1B, there's interleukin 6, there is key signal modulators, tumor necrosis factor alpha. And these signal mediators need to go through the roof. They need to go high. They need to go as high as you can get them post-workout. We, we have a word for that. It's called inflammation. You want to be as inflamed as possible post-workout. And the reason is, you know, working out, it's, it's like any other, it's like any other injury. You're, you're, you're training right. and you, you injure the muscle fibers and then the immune system says, let's repair this. And then you repair, right? Well, the immune system is sort of like the signal caller. And so that tells us a better way to recover, which is you don't want to take antioxidants post-workout. So right away, get that off the table. You do want to get inflamed. And so once you start to understand this and understand like the immune system calls the shots, it gives you real easy to do actionable items. And the biggest difference overall is really that we're out to save time. That's the biggest difference. Like we're out to cut down the amount of time it takes to get the results. And so when you, once you understand what the switches and dials are, you stop wasting time. You just go right to the switches and dials. And that's, that's kind of a, it's like an easy way to understand it. And when, oh, so that's a great explanation. I'm sorry to cut you off flat, but while I have this thought, I'm, a, I'm going to assume over here, many of us do not have a healthy gut. 
so then my 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 follow up question to that would be, if that's the case, how long typically can the average person, let's say me for example, uh, go from not not a healthy gut to a healthy gut? Super it depends fast. on it depends on the extent of not good. <laughs> <laughs> it ex- <laughs> right, but okay. Well, I'll take that average. So so Vlad over here actively works out. He takes about I don't know maybe forty pills a day. I think he's at right now. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I, I, so I I am uh, on the other end of the spectrum uh, from Vlad. So you can think of me as the average you know uh, person that uh, you know you know. Uh, so that's why I was so. So you said really fast. So walk me through that. So walk walk me through that stuff because so if I because we we're, we're, were talking about inflamed fat in order to in order to help that we want to go ahead and make sure that our gut is healthy. So are we talking about like prebiotics, postbiotics, biotics, or, or uh, it, w- what's the deal? What's the, what's the protocol? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the protocol I introduced in the immunity code is food based for the most part. Food based. Okay. So not taking pills no no Which so it's good i'm actually glad to hear that <laughs> yeah yeah so the first thing to understand is that food has physical properties that cannot be replicated with pills okay one of those is bulk okay so when you take bulk like let's use the example of fiber when you take bulky fiber into the gut so so the body's a tube okay and starts here and it ends at the other end and in, and in between there's just a big long tube That's essentially the body. And so when you take in food with physical properties, you stretch the tube in 360 degrees. Okay. And so we have what we call the brush border, the brush zone. And and in other words, food is actually making contact with the cells that line Mm. the tube. And as it's pushing through, it's doing it all the way through. So you can kind of think of it as like a paintbrush. Like, uh, have you ever seen one of those Mm. circular paintbrushes, you know, Mm -hmm. like a pipe cleaner? Mm -hmm. So food has that physical property. Pills don't. Pills don't have right. that property, okay? So when your bacteria is mixed into the equation, what's happening is just think of like that pipe cleaner going through the pipe and there's all kinds of bacteria in the lumen, in the middle, and in around the sides. And as that food is going through, it's creating an advantage for some of those bacteria and a disadvantage for others, okay? So it feeds some of those bacteria. Others, it starves them out. And so as that food is going through the whole tube, it's feeding the right bacteria where they need to be fed, okay? That's a physical property that can't be replicated with pills. So mm-hmm. the, the immunity code protocol is really very simple. Like literally, it started with a bag of apples. I mean, that's, that's how simple it is. And basically, it's um, what you're going to do is you're going to, and this gets really fascinating, you're going to mimic the same foods you would have if you were foraging. It's kind of it. Okay. And Mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Um, We'll talk about this later about nature's rhythms, but long, long story short, this is the era where fasting quote unquote is popular, you know? Okay. Well, that's always had a place in nature's rhythms. We just, we just use different words for it. We called it either going hungry or we called it famine. Okay. One of the Mm -hmm. two, but historically speaking, going hungry and famine has always had a partner, a dance partner, and that's foraging. Okay, so foraging means you're looking for things that are nobody's first pick, generally speaking. Like foraging foods are things like roots or leafy greens or mushrooms Mm -hmm. or, you know, I mean, you know, I'd rather have like a, you know, a trout or or like a piece of steak. I mean, you know, generally speaking, foods of lesser preference. In fact, they there was a, a study done on the Hazda that asked them to rank their foods. And they actually, they actually 100% came up with a food ranking that 100% reflects what I'm saying. So number one in their list was honey, number two was meat. And at the bottom of the list were foraging foods, roots, okay? So foraging foods feed the bacteria that a very interesting thing happens. The bacteria that are fed by foraging foods literally one-to-one mimic the benefits of fasting. And, and you can go down a list and create a spreadsheet. I've done it and just check it off. Like, wow, foraging foods stimulate AMPK uh, through these bacteria, stimulates um, HDAC through this bacteria. And nature has this way it's provided to kind of slow down the aging process when, when you're going hungry through, through foods of lesser preference. So a simple way is foraging foods. And specifically what that means is 
in the immunity code gut reset, you're going to basically be doing a, a gut protocol that consists of um, apple peels and um, berry phenols, like the, the color pigments from berries, and then one other goodie, which is um, human milk oligosaccharides, which are uh, carbohydrates in mother's milk, and then mm. resistant starch. And so those, it's those four things that are in the picture. And you do that for about 10, 10 to 20 days. And the differences are shocking, like absolutely shocking, absolutely shocking. I've seen people many, many times uh, go from having gluten intolerance to completely getting rid of it, uh, being lactose intolerant, completely getting rid of that, um, having all kinds of uh, skin issues, dermatitis, all that, completely getting rid of that. And it's just the power. It shows you two things. It shows you how fast the gut can be recolonized, and it mm. shows you th how far-reaching the impact is on the gut from, with everything else. And really, it's just food. It's just feeding the bacteria what they need, the right bacteria, what they need to proliferate. That's the basic idea. So. Mm -hmm. And since we since we touch the topic of uh, nature's rhythms, and you speak a lot about it, but nowadays when everything is you know everybody is running twenty four seven, the lifestyle is crazy, especially in uh, you know in big cities. How can average pe person even align themselves with these rhythms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's the big problem, right? I mean, civilization is the problem. I mean, we can all agree, right? That's that's this whole this whole era of quote unquote biohacking, it's it what it subconsciously acknowledges is that the problem is civilization. And there's an easy fix. It's just go be a hunter gatherer. You solve everything, right? But nobody's gonna do it. <laughs> so so in lieu of being a hunter gatherer, how do you fix this? Well there's there's three primary rhythms that nature has, three big buckets. One is light and dark, the other's hot and cold, and the other is dietary. Those are the three basic buckets of nature's rhythms. And so for the average person, you know, we call them hacks, biohacks, it's it's finding a shortcut to mimic, um, to realign with light and dark, to realign with getting hot and getting cold. And then pretty much the subject of my new book, it's to realign with the natural food rhythms you find in nature, which we just talked about one of them, which is going hungry and foraging foods. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you spoke about the recovering the gut, uh, the protocol is the same for everybody or it's supposed to be different for uh, every individual? The, the foundation, there, so there's layers, um, there's, there's levels to this game. And the first layer is what I spoke of, which is the immunity code gut protocol. And that's the red phenols, the human milk oligosaccharides, um, resistant starch. And then the next level on that just depends on what kind of gut issues you have. So it's very common in the post COVID era, era to see a lot of gut issues. How do we identify these issues in the gut? Most people, um, you know, most people that have persistent gut issues have had some kind of diagnosis typically. Um, mm. you'll, you'll find it's pretty common. So it could be, could be colitis, could be SIBO, could be, you know, a candida problem. It could be IBD. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here. And, and typically that requires a doctor to diagnose for you. But the easy sort of way to understand these things is through constant bloating, um, through histamine reactions, through skin issues. Skin issues are probably one of the, the biggest tells. Mm. Um, an inability to handle dairy, inability to handle like, like uh, grains. Those are all tells that um, your gut needs some work. Mm -hmm. And do you have to do the protocol once a year, twice a year, every other year, like, or you just do it once and you are good? What I suggest is everybody in the world should do the basic protocol once or twice a year. And then, and then during the year, you're just maintaining. That's mm -hmm. kind of like what I suggest. And then the only thing that can throw that off is like you're, you know, you have a bad week and you eat a bunch of junk food, you know, or you go out and have a bad weekend and you, you know, party too hard and all that. So, so the gut is not like a fixed variable. It's an, it's like the weather it's changing constantly. And so, mm -hmm. Um, it does bring us into a, to one of the more important concepts, I think, that I've been talking about a lot that um, really needs to get out there. And it is getting away from daily anything. And that's, that's a, you never hear that. <laughs> you don't hear that from anybody. That's a, yeah, that's a really good point. Can, can you elaborate on that? 
Well, you shouldn't be doing anything daily for the most part. That's really it. That's the simple answer. And um, you're never going to hear this. Never going to hear it really because people are too invested in either selling supplements or something. But the truth is, if you were in nature, part of nature's rhythms, um, if you want to, if you want to get back and realign with the dietary rhythms of nature, you need to do one thing, and that's you need to mimic scarcity. That that's the that's the foundational driver in nature is scarcity. You don't. So the difference between nature or civilization and nature is refrigerators. You know, right. it's not like it's not like you go and. You know, you've never seen anybody on alone or naked and afraid, you know, walk up to the refrigerator and pull out a juicy right. ribeye. You're never going to see right. that. That's the whole point of the show is there's no refrigerators. So that means scarcity. And the natural rhythm that you find in nature induced by scarcity is called variety. So, so scarcity by its very nature creates variety. And variety is a protection. It's part of nature's rhythms. It protects you from getting too much of anything. And, and, and that's a, that's kind of a, that is a concept that the industry is 10 years behind in figuring out that you can do too much of anything. And, and I don't, it doesn't matter what it is. You can do too much protein. You can do too much, uh, too much of your daily greens. You can do too much of anything. Hmm. Very I, often. Yeah, that's a really good point. Th that's that's, what, that's why right point. now it's very popular and, and growing <clears throat> to do the fasting, the dry fasting, the water fasting, because you can do the scarcity to your, uh, to your, to your body, to your organs and everything. You can do too much fasting. So, you know, everything needs to be in balance. What, what I see a lot of now are people that are five years in on the keto fasting carnivore bandwagon and their guts are destroyed. I mean, their guts are wrecked. And there's a concept in my new book I, I talk about and I, I show a graph and it looks like a sine wave. You know, it's one of those, you know, curves that goes like that. And there's a there's a there's something that's missing it's big and it's called time <laughs> time is missing in the way we understand the uh how things work and so what you tend to see up front is just about it. Well, lots of things work really great up front they work fantastic you know and and that's the benefits phase so this is when people go online and talk about the benefits like oh i did this and it changed my life and i you know i, I did this diet and look how lean i am now but nobody ever talks about the negatives phase so the negatives right. phase takes time. It takes a few years, but, but if you do something too long, you know, the dose is the poison. Eventually, in most cases, you're going to see negatives and you, you just don't hear about it unless you go on Reddit. You could type in like, you know, carnivore diet, you know, gut problems, right? I mean, and you'll see person after person talking about this, this thing. And again, this just gets back to, um, variety, diversity, scarcity, all of these things are part of the rhythms of nature. And this gets us back to, you know, all these things we take for granted, like, you know, your, your daily, whatever, um, it's probably not a good idea long-term. In fact, I can, I could actually prove that. I could actually show you that if your goal is longevity, probably the worst thing you could do would be to take antioxidants every day. I mean, we could prove that easily. This is, this is very interesting. This is a very interesting conversation because of what you just said. And I actually agree with you. Um, the, the, the very essence of just, introducing variety and that extends to the types of the kinds of food you eat, right? Meats, nuts, berries. I mean, if we're just eating the same meal, you know, for, for every year I mean, for you know, the same thing for breakfast, the same thing for lunch, I, I can see how that's terrible, terrible for our body. Um, so I'm assuming that this is really beneficial for the average person. And not when I, when I talk about these things and I talk about, any industries to guess, I always try to relay it back to the average person because, you know, most of us are listening are not trying to, I don't know, live to 200 years old or add on 25 pounds of muscle mass or, you know, extreme versions and, and, stuff, and stuff like that. And so is it fair to say that in general, for people that are listening right now, they should intro introduce a variety of different foods and nutrient options in their it, 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 you know, if you're eating steak on Monday, you know, Tuesday, enjoy some fish. Wednesday, don't enjoy any fish or any kind of, you know, poultry or steak. Uh, exercise, you know, same thing with exercise, right? We have different regimens. We, we, we switch it up. So the, the, the whole notion of keeping it different, is that going to, is, is, does that benefit? I'm, I'm assuming that really benefits the, 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 the end consumers. Yes. 
Um, I would I, I would offer at the high level that there's only one one way to achieve lasting health. Uh, one big one one big pattern, and that's dietarily speaking, because diet's the number one thing that's going to kill you. Like cardiovascular disease, that's that's from that's from your diet, and that's the leading cause of death. So let's just take that for example. Um, that the the way to get to health is that your diet is nutrient dense, diverse, and balanced. That that's what I would argue is the best path. And in fact, uh, very interesting. There was a study that was just published, and it was looking at um, improving mitochondrial health. And they compared um, all the popular diets of today. So they compared keto. They looked at low carb, carnivore. Looked at everything, vegan. And the winner, the, the diet that best impacted cardio, or excuse me, best impacted the health of the mitochondria, was the Mediterranean diet, a healthy diverse, balanced diet. Beat, beat all of these. Now, it's not to say that some of these, for example, keto, had a lot of benefits, had a lot of benefits to the mitochondria, but also had negatives. And the negatives play out more over time than they do in the short term. So if the long term is the thing, and that's the other point, when it comes to your health, you know, we, we got to get away from the short term thing because your health is dictated by meal by meal inputs over decades. That's the thing that's going to kill you. Okay. So it's, it's the slow, invisible, gradual lining of the arteries with plaque and, you know, all these other things that happen from meals and from foods that ultimately that's, what's going to be the thing that kills you and wrecks your health. And, and, um, you know, I've seen it. I mean, I've, I've been around a while and I've seen people that were supposed to be really healthy and, really were in terrible health. They looked good, but were in terrible health and died young. Like there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's no end of fit looking people dead before 55. And I've just seen it so much over the years. So, um, the long-term approach that basically takes a few really important kind of high level, um, rules. One is that you really, at the end of the day, the thing that's going to serve you best, best is a diverse nutrient dense balanced diet. That's really going to beat everything long-term. And that all of the problems you're going to face, they're the result of long-term accumulation of things. That, that's, that's the truth. I mean, I'm not making that up, but you can go verify right. that right now. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Let, let's speak about um, the weight loss, because I think this is a huge topic. It, it, it used to be a huge topic. It is right now. I think it will never be. <laughs> Everybody wants to lose the weight. Yeah. And uh, most of us, you know, we're doing all the exercises, any programs out there. I mean, you know, and then we put all this weight back on, I don't know, maybe in a couple of months or, or even sooner. And uh, in your book, you talk about the daisy cutter method for the rapid fat loss. Could you elaborate on this method and why it's so effective? Well, um, it's not for everybody. Um, and it's, it's very extreme. And it, it definitely works for rapid fat loss. Um, I, I would, before I get into that, let me just create a, let me create a kind of a, a meta paradigm to put everything under, which is that the most common outcome from, for most people from, from weight loss and fat loss is weight regain. That's the most common outcome. Okay. So it doesn't matter how good you look in the, in the selfie at 90 days. That's not important. What's important is the selfie at five years. That's the one that tells the real story. So the most common outcome number one, isn't just to regain the weight once. It's to set off a cycle of losing weight, regaining weight. And there's a cumulative cost to that. The cumulative cost is that every time you're going to the fat loss well, you are, you are banging the drum of very ancient defense mechanisms the body has to protect against starvation and famine. Okay. And these are identifiable. They are measurable. I, I give an example in my new book, which is a um, brand new study just came out and it showed post fat loss, pre post fat loss. They looked at the brains of some subjects and they looked at the, the neurons responsible for food intake. And they found that the neurons that drive food intake tripled, tripled post fat loss. Okay. So in other words, you've got a three times 
you've got three times the input, three times the signals telling you to go go eat post fat loss that you had before. So that's that's a physical mechanism that can be inventoried and quantified, and and that's one of about thirty to forty different mechanisms. So all that to say, in this big umbrella, if you wanna if you wanna get the outcome you want, which is to get lean and, and maintain that across a lifetime, you have to you have to go through that door, understanding that you're setting off a whole line of dominoes that can play out for 30, 40 years. And when you talk to people in their 50s, they'll all tell you the same thing. They'll tell you, yeah, yeah, I did the Atkins diet back in the day, like in the 80s and worked great. You know, man, I was good for five years. And then, uh, I don't know, I kind of regained the weight. And then, you know, and then I tried keto and, you know, that worked pretty good. And then, but I regained the weight and, and then I did it again. It worked pretty good, but but then it didn't work at all. It was weird. And so now I'm doing carnivore and, and um, nothing really works now. And I can't lose weight. And that's, that's the story you hear. All, mm-hmm. <laughs> nine times out of 10, you hear that story. Yeah. That's the road. That's the set of dominoes that you're kicking off when you start this journey. So you got to know that up front, because if you don't know that up front, you don't know how to beat it. And, and the goal is to beat the game, right? So to answer your question, the daisy cutter is pretty simple. I mean, high level. Basically, you're you're taking taking really dense, cruciferous, um, fibrous carbs, super high. You're taking protein, super high, and you're taking fat to almost zero. And that's it. That's the trick. I mean, there's nothing nothing magical in that, really. It's there's n- not even anything new in that. That's kind of like a last week of pre-contest back in the you know late '80s. That would have been the diet. So nothing. But what makes it work is <clears throat> that you you feed the you feed the microbiome so much of the food that it needs for bifidobacteria. So bifidobacteria does really well with um, hemicellulose and all these different fibers. So you, you, you just increase these populations of bacteria that um, make insulin function work a lot better and, and help you get lean. And that's one of the reasons it works so fast. Um, and it works really well, but the thing to understand too is that, let's bring back in time, it's going to change over time. So you only have so many trips to the well with it. Like I'm gosh, I think the first time I did it was 2007. I can't do it anymore. Like not in the current form because my brain has adapted to it. And where at first, when I first did it, you know, 18 years ago, green beans didn't bother me. Now it's mm-hmm. like, I, I, I've kind of had my last green bean. <laughs> <I'm kinda laughs> there. So it works on a curve, um, like everything else. And I'm just telling you that up front. So if you do it, you do it strategically and you do it when you need it most. And I, I think the either at the start of a fat loss period or at the end is the place for it. Um, and then on top of that, new concept is the offset. You have to include an offset with it, which is to offset the weight regain. And if you do those two things, it can be very, very, very effective. But um, yeah, high level, I mean, it's just, you take, you take fibrous car. Oh, in fact, interesting anecdote. I've had people get to three millimoles of ketones in their serum on this. <laughs> on carbs okay that's crazy yeah but even 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 if i do this uh method but still it doesn't guarantee that i'm not going to be regaining my weight back right it's still oh, gosh, no. it's it's yeah. still it's still all about your uh your lifestyle to change your your thinking the way the you do the things this is the only can guarantee that you will not gain your weight back I disagree. Um, so first of all, yes, you're correct. The, the, the daisy cutter is not going to, you know, you, you have to do an offset or you're very, you, you can regain the weight. I, di- I disagree when it comes to the idea. And this is counter. Most people would not agree with me on this and I'm fine with it. But I just say this out of, you know, a lot of many decades of, of seeing the reality play out. Um, that we think it's this thing of lifestyle choices and I got to just, you know, make these good choices and, you know, I got to get to the gym. I got to do these things. And that's really not the thing. I mean, that, that's, that's really not it. What we're up against, you're up against about 20 variables that are all, any single one of them, any single one of these variables is very difficult to overcome. And then you got 20 of them working all together. And so even if you even if you, you know, you're quote unquote, you're into making good lifestyle choices, the odds are, the odds are against you. You know, I'm just, I'm just looking at this from a math perspective. The, 
the percent likelihood of weight gain over time is highly likely. And the trick is to change the math and get it to where it's much less likely. And I'll give you one example. One, post-COVID, bifidobacteria is destroyed in the gut of most people, okay? And so post-COVID, everybody's noticing, ah, oh, gosh, I'm just putting weight on. What's going on? What's happening? Well, this has now been documented that COVID wipes out bifidobacteria in the gut. And when that happens, that wipes out immune function. It wipes out insulin mm. function. It wipes out all these things. It's very, very, very difficult to not gain weight. It's very easy to gain weight. So, so is the solution to that, you know, some lifestyle commitment or is it actually understanding the nature of the problem? And okay, I need to repopulate bifido in the gut. And if I do that, that solves a lot of problems and it takes no time. Mm. So my, my bias is that time for most people goes to zero and we need solutions that take very little time but have very big impact and so increasing bifido is one of those answers like if you know how to do that it's very simple and how do you do that Th through diet right through diet yeah so basic your, your template is resistant starch roots things like cruciferous vegetables inulins um you know entire categories of foods berries um and dairy those those are your your foundation for the fiddle you know and, okay. and once you understand that you kind of know how to steer the wheel so to speak i get i guess i need i need a diet how to gain the weight because i always have this problem <laughs> all my life i'm i'm hunting for my gate for my weight not how to lose it <laughs> yeah yeah well, uh, where, Vlad, where are you from originally from central asia uzbekistan uzbekistan yeah so that's interesting um what what so what you see from people of that part of the world um and i know i know a, a handful of people from that part of the world they tend to be leaner and fitter generally speaking okay uh, um and a lot of it is i think it's diet i think it's the, the ancestral diet or not even the ancestral just even the, the diet that you get there it's very it's very gut friendly in a lot of respects and it makes it um much easier much easier so you inherit your microbiome from your parents to a large degree. And that sets, it sets the body's sort of a ability to drop weight or gain weight across a lifetime. And that gets into a whole other thing, but I think it's kind of interesting. Well, Vlad, that's, that's my excuse because for my genetics, South, South Asian <laughs> peoples, <clears throat> we have horrible genetics, uh, <laughs> especially when it comes to a diet and storing body fat in the worst place possible, which is right in your stomach. Uh, but Joel, I do want to move the conversation into a very popular uh, uh, segment here, which of course is the GLP-1 drugs like Ozempic. This is being talked about uh, uh, by everybody and anybody. You have companies that are worth, mm, they are absolute giants. Uh, so what's your current, tr uh, what's your take on the current trend of GLP-1 drugs? Well, on the one hand, so I've had, over the last coming up on 20 years now, I don't know, well over, well over 30,000 people that I've, you know, in one way or another kind of been over their fat loss journey, you know, whether mm -hmm. it was through my software or through the immunity code or something. And when you do that, and I have a, I have a fat loss course, immune centric fat loss course. And when you do that long enough, what you eventually see is that there are people that no matter what you throw at them, apart from steroids, no matter what you throw at them, you can't get them to drop weight. So you get them, you get them calorie counting, you get them subcaloric, you get them on all the right foods and they still don't drop weight. And once you've seen enough of those, you know, something like these GLP-1 drugs are, are kind of a miracle in the sense that it's the first thing that ever works for a lot of people, you know? Uh, so that, that's a positive. Um, the negative really is the long-term fallout of, of the, of the suggested dosing schedule, because I don't know that that's 100% known. Even though these drugs have been around a while, you know, they were meant for diabetics. Right. And so when you start putting regular people on these, on, on something that, you know, was meant to be a diabetic drug for life, but now they're on these short term and coming off them and they're doing, you know, relatively speaking, very high doses. Um, there's definitely an area of concern, particularly with respect to some of the adjuvants that are in this stuff. Um, one of them opens up the gut lining. So it actually creates leaky gut in order to absorb the drug. <laughs> okay. So like me personally, mm. if I was taking, you know, the, the recommended dose, I would be doing my own gut reset every step of the way with it to shut the gut. I wouldn't 
let that happen. Um, my friend, Dr. Tina Moore's kind of led the charge in terms of um, microdosing these GLP ones. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she would tell you that it's, it's worked great where she sees mostly the benefits without the negatives. So on the one hand, I think that I hate to say this. I really do. I really don't want to say this, but it's true. I think the future is drugs. I mean, I just hate to say it. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, take a look at the market caps of the company. Take a look at the demand. Of uh, course, it's I mean, the future. Are, Pharmaceutical companies yeah. making this a future. I mean, we're at this we're at this advent right now. I talk about on my Instagram a lot about synthetic biology, or, or rather, what's known as SynBio, and synthetic biology runs side by side with AI. Um, they're kind of parallel disciplines, and essentially, what's happening is. With AI, they can decode the cell. And then with synthetic biology, you can rebuild the cell. And with that, it's possible to create better drugs and more targeted drugs. And, you know, I mean, there's just, there are drugs out now that they're kind of miracle drugs like Rapatha, you know, for for plaque. Um, There's an Alzheimer's drug coming out that's not quite there yet, but it's getting close. Do you consider supplements also bad drugs? No, no, because supplements just don't work the way that drugs do. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. supplements, they just don't work that way. They don't, uh, they don't work with that kind of power. I think, um, supplements are supplemental and I think they have a place. I mean, I sell supplements, but again, getting back to that daily thing, I think I'm the only guy I know of that, that actually advocates not taking my own supplements every day, (laughs) which, you know, it's the the accountant looks at, look at, looks at the revenue. You know, we do these revenue reviews and they're like, you know, you take three times the money by just selling these things as daily. (laughs) I actually wanted to ask when you say don't take daily, do you mean like, uh, do you mean not take daily or take it, let's say one month and take a break for one month and then uh, go back again, taking it, or it's really like, take today, don't take tomorrow. And day after I'm like this, like this depends on the supplement. So like, for example, supplemental vitamin D, um, makes a good case. Like you might want to, you know, take it during a certain period of the year for a month or so, and then go off it. Or if you had a strategic goal, like losing body fat, you know, for like a month, it could make some sense. So, so that's one example. Um, or like with my own stuff. Um, so my own stuff is geared at, at anti-aging. And when you break down anti-aging, you don't want to take the same thing daily because you have opposing mechanisms that both need stimulation. So on this hand, Hmm. you have uh, nitric oxide, which requires free radicals to be stimulated. And then on this hand over here, you have, um, you have the need for reduction or neutralizing reactive oxygen species or free radicals. And so they are, they are mutually opposed to each other and you don't necessarily want them to happen at the same time. And, and you'll find that's true of a lot of things in the body. Like a lot of things in the body work like work like the two pedals on a bike, you know, like they're, they, they oppose each other, but they're both necessary. So like with my own stuff, you do like the, the anti-aging stuff three days a week, like Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and that's, that's the antioxidant side. And then you do the gut and the vascular stuff on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which is the, which is the nitric oxide side. And so that way, we're not squashing, we're not squashing Mm. the the free radical production, you know? So that's an example where you're doing, you're doing, you're doing stuff every day, but it's different. You're doing three days a week of this one, three days a week of that one. That's an example. Okay. And before, before we spoke about the, um, the microbiome, the supplements and the diets and all the stuff, and we touched the topic of, um, to make it individual for everybody. And of course, right now with all this AI and all this uh, new technologies, I mean, it's becoming more and more possible. What's your take on this? Will the AI help us to make it all very nice, personalized nutrition plans and supplements? So it's just for me, just for you, just for Anaya. Yeah. So that's an interesting topic. We could do a whole podcast on that. Um, so on the one hand, when you look at the healthiest people who've ever lived, you know, like a good example, these are hunter-gatherer groups they all eat the same stuff. There's no personalized diets. Okay. Uh, a good example would be the Semaine who are this hunter gatherer group in Bolivia and they had the best cardiovascular health ever tested of any human group. And they pretty much eat the same stuff. Everybody, everybody eats the same stuff. And then as you go back and you look at history and you look at all the studies on what our ancestors really ate, you find that 
in a given region, everybody ate the same stuff. So there was no personalized diets. So you have to kind of keep that in mind as we start to talk about this whole idea of the individualized diet. Um, and what you find when you go down this road is that there's two levels. There's the commonalities, and then there's the individual differences. And what you find is that very often, not always, but very often, most of the horsepower, like 85% of it is in the commonalities. It's in the things that are common to everybody. And so I'll just make a couple examples here. Um, you know, most people in the world today have low vitamin D. That's just a commonality. And you fix that one problem, you fix like 40% of the problem. And then most people don't oxygenate properly when they sleep. You know, they're, they're, they're under oxygenating when they sleep, called a hypoxia, snoring, whatever, you know. You fix that problem, you solve 20% of the problem. So now you're up to 60% of the problem solved, right? With just two steps. In fact, this, what I'm giving you actually is the immunity code. This is actually the mm. immunity code. Then there's the gut. And it turns out most people will benefit, most people are underrepresented with bifidobacteria and acromantia. And if you just increase those two bacteria, you solve 40% of the problem, okay? So like literally we're solving 90, 95% of the problem with three fixes here, okay? And now what's left? Well, maybe the individual differences now, things you're, that, that, that get into like, you know, genetics and things AI can solve. But really, for most people, they're so off on the basics that if you just fix the basics, simple things, massive, massive improvements in health and longevity are possible. I agree with you on this topic, on this point, 100%. I think... Uh... There's going to be a lot of companies to come out to try to take advantage of hyper personalizing in many different industries when in reality, we don't need it. There are already companies and I actually wanted to ask you, what do you think about the companies where you send them your uh, saliva, stool, uh, your urine, and they analyze all this and they send you supplements according to your analysis. So what do you think about these companies? <laughs> that is, well, there are so many flaws in that. I don't know where to start. Uh, so the idea is that genetics dictates everything, and it, and it doesn't. Um, in fact, you have three. You have three. You have three genomes in you. They're only testing. So let me break this down a little bit. Um, so your human genome is different in every organ of your body. It's different in different locations. You don't have the same genome throughout your body. It's different. Okay. So the idea that you have this genome, they test it and you go, oh, that's you. That, no, that's not how it works. Your genome is different across your entire body. <laughs> like if you were to test the genome in your liver and the genome in your brain, they'd look different. You know, they're going to be similar, but they're not going to be exactly the same. The next is that you have two other genomes in your body. You have the, you have the mitochondrial genome, which they're not testing. And then you have the, the microbiome genome. And of those three, the microbiome is the one with the most, gen with the most genes. And it's the most malleable. Like it, you can acquire genes, you mm -hmm. can lose genes. I mean, you can rapidly change the equation rapidly. So it's not to say that genetic tests cannot be useful. For example, you know, you send a genetic test out and it shows you have some, a good example would be like, you lack the enzyme to make cholecalciferol. Okay. That's a big one. That's a really big one. So that would be great. You know, that's something extremely useful. But the other side of that would be, very often when I've seen the recommendations that come from these things, they're not very well thought out in general. I mean, it's just, it's just like, you know, they'll hire somebody, they'll hire a scientist guy to write the recommendations, but those aren't the, if you took 20 different smart guys and put them around a table or a hundred, you, you'd get different answers. And so very often, the, and I say this cause I, I built one of these. Okay. In my old nutrition system, I had a questionnaire and in that questionnaire, we had answers and I never sold supplements with it, but I could have, I could have, I could have lent it out to like, you know, well, you answered and said, you have a problem shutting your brain off at night. Therefore you need GABA. I could have done that. I, mean, I could have sold that all day long. So I'm just telling you from a guy who's built those kinds of questionnaires that there's a lot of subjectivity to those things. Um, they can be very useful. They're not the gospel. They're not, I wouldn't, look at it and go, oh my gosh, this is me. Yes, they figured me out finally. It, there's way more to the equation. Well, Vlad, I mean, I, there's actually been a couple of articles that I've read over the past, I, I think 
even a couple of months ago, I'll send you them, Vlad. I'm not going to name the company. I know what company you're talking about, but there's a lot of uh, takes on the up, on the side that Joel's leaning towards, which is a lot of it's unfounded, and there's a lot of claims that don't hold really a lot of merit uh, via these tests and then recommendations. I mean, just again, you have to double check your analysis if you have any improvements. And plus, as you're saying, you have to take a break sometimes. So you just have to do your own job and your own research and your own opinion, not not to be, you know, the, as you said, they are gospel. That's it. I'm going to take it, do whatever they say, and I'm happy and healthy. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Sure. Um, I think you hit it on the head, Vlad, which is you can read these things, and I think you can take things away that are useful, but, you know, we have this tendency. I, I actually wrote about this in the new book. We kind of become little children when we re, when we hear authoritative stuff or read authoritative stuff that you know with nice fancy graphics and talks about genomics and uses big words we don't understand and we kind of just become like little kids and go okay whatever you say i'll do you know but, but really i think we're past that age where you got to kind of start to think for yourself a little bit again and you have to you have to take everything with a grain of salt what's your thoughts on uh what's that company called Vlad? we were just talking about with the nad plus uh, true true nitrogen True Nigen, they're like the oh, the yes. hottest Remedex. thing for the last two years now. Yeah. Uh, what What are your thoughts on that? I know them very well. <laughs> oh, you know them very well. Okay, very in a well. in a good way or a bad way? <laughs> uh, neither. Um, my so in, I used to have a product called Amped Keto that used their their um, their their Niagen in it. Or no, actually, I okay. used um, I used a couple of their products. I used they had they had a couple of ingredients that I used, and so it's an interesting story. Um, they came out with two ingredients uh, in the mid 2015s. Um, one of them was called Pure Energy, which was a, um, a, a resveratrol derivative. It was called terastilbene bound to caffeine. That was amazing stuff. And then they came out with their um, with their nicotinamide riboside product that they labeled True Niagen. And they were just an ingredient seller. And then what happened is these two dudes who were marketers out of Stanford figured out, you know, they could use their marketing background and sell a ton of this stuff. And so they did what a, <laughs> they did what a lot of guys yeah. do, you know, they, they went and got some venture funding and then hired a science board to look authoritative who never actually had anything to do with the product to begin with. Mm. Um, so you'd go to the website and go, Oh my gosh, look at all this science that went into this. Wow. You know? That's what exactly what I thought, because it was, that, that's what I was going to say that these, this is some genius level marketing because it's very yeah. convincing. It, this very is convincing. crazy. We as average people who know nothing about it, I mean, we look at it, we okay, we read it, it's good, scientists backed it. So how do we supposed to believe to all this stuff? I mean, because there are a lot of the 1,000 supplements, 1,000 different companies, 1,000 different approaches, and, and all of them are nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're speaking to the most important question, I think, um, here, which is confusion. Uh, you know, like you have, you have all this you know, well-credentialed people contradicting each other. And how the heck do you know what's true, right? And that's the single biggest problem facing consumers nowadays is is really breaking through the nonsense and, and coming back to what's true. Like, how, how do we know what's true? Um, in fact, my new book, that's, that's the whole purpose of the book was two things. Number one was to help you align dietarily with nature's rhythms. And number two, to create a new framework for confusion, to break confusion. A, a new mm. framework, a new pair of glasses that you put on. Um, so I'll give you an example of, of one way to do that. And that just involves, <clears throat> there are realities. A reality is a thing that um, you can pretend it's not there, but it's there. And eventually you, you bump into it. Like one of them is crossing a freeway. You know, not a good idea to do that. Like <laughs> generally speaking, walking across a freeway is you know, the reality is you're going to get killed, right? That's stupid. Um, you could pretend that's not true, but if you try it, you'll find out the hard way. So a reality I talk about in my new book that's missing is time. And an easy way to understand time as a lens or a framework is to just go into a different discipline that's already figured it out. That would be psychiatric meds. So when you look at psychiatric meds and you look at like SSRIs, um, mm -hmm. there's an interesting history. So you go back to the early 90s and they've got Prozac 
And when Prozac first came out and you read about it, you know, there were books like listening to Prozac and, and testimonials from people like, oh, it's changed my life. I'm a different person. Wow. And, and you know, oh, this is so great. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a relationship a, and a bad one. Okay. And then the long term now, you know, 20 years later is, mm, yeah. So <clears throat> while we know that in the short term, um, these SSRIs have a lot of benefits, there are a lot of negatives in the long term. So up front, you might gain some weight and all that. You might feel better, but long term, you might, or up front, you might lose weight. But long term, uh, we know now you're probably going to gain weight and there could mm. be, um, you know, changes to your, um, changes to the way your brain works that, so that the negatives outweigh the positives. And, you know, we don't know if this is, you know, we have to be very careful in giving these. So that now psych meds incorporate time, right? That's missing, completely missing, completely missing when it comes to nutrition and diet. Right. You, you can take any topic, any topic and just go, Hey, our keto diet's good. <laughs> and what you're going to hear is yes. Or no, you're going to hear that. What you're not going to hear is right. at what point in time. You're right. never going to hear that, okay? Right. And the, the truth is, I guess I use the relationship analogy. You know, up front, it's like, oh, man, she's so hot and she's so funny and just makes me laugh. And I've never had this much fun with someone, you know? And then you check back four years later, you're like, dude, she's a total narcissist. I didn't see it up front, <laughs> you know? She's crazy. You know? Okay, you see this? Well, that's just, that's just time and wisdom. Well, well, yeah, that's a lens that the average consumer needs to know. Hey, that's missing. And now put this on and here's some questions you can ask. And, and it changes absolutely freaking everything about diet and nutrition. Once you start incorporating time, you know, you go, you go, you go, oh yeah. What about, um, what about fasting, man? That's good. Right. Um, what point in time? What? Right. At what point in time is it good? What do you mean? At what point in time is it good? I mean, always, right? Uh, really? No. <laughs> Short term, yeah, you get these good. benefits. Yeah. Midterm, this. Long term, could be this. Just be aware. Be careful, right? It changes the equation. And that's, that's one way, one simple way to take back sense as a consumer and start to make sense of things. You know, like you'll hear mm -hmm. saturated fats. You hear, you know, one camp is like, nah, pff, we were wrong. All these years, we thought saturated fats were bad. We were wrong. Saturated fats are great. Go have as many as you can get. And then the other side is like, you're out of your mind. I'm a cardiologist. They're bad, blah, blah, blah. You know, you hear these two sides. And you just, just bring time into that equation. When you bring time into it, it changes everything. Well, I would right. say, yeah, no, if you're in your 20s and 30s, it's probably going to have no effect on you. If you're in your 50s and the, the, uh, the cardiovascular system has declined, you've lost key structures in the cardiovascular system, saturated fats are a real concern. What's the difference? Time. Make, mm. Helps you make sense. Joel, we have a tradition uh, <laughs> on this uh, sh uh, on the podcast, which is we always ask the guest before us to give a question to the to the next guest. And so we have a question for you from our last guest. The question is: Are you living your values in your work, and what's holding you back from doing that? Yeah, I think I am. I mean, I I kind of view myself as kind of i would almost say retired in a way like like i just do my favorite thing to do is do what i do which is work and right. so i get to do what i love to do and it's not work to me it's fun and i like i like what i do and i'm like i like my role in what i do which is i'm just trying to speak truth and you know and it costs me a lot to do that like I could have sold, I mean, I could have sold, I could have sold a lot of things, you know, pre-workouts, whey protein, had offers to sell pro hormones years ago. I could have made millions and millions of dollars selling that stuff. But to me, I wanted to just get to what was true and solve the problems everybody faces that most people face. So I would say that it's been a long road, years and years and years, and at times very hard, very painful. But I'm in a season now where, you know, all that time and stuff has paid off and, you know, I, I get to do what I like and I'm, I'm still just trying to speak truth. Right. So I'd have to think more on it, but I kind of think I do. No, I love that. No, I love that. that that's, that's a, that is a great answer. Uh, Vlad, do you, are you living the values in your work? 
I am hundred yeah. percent. Well, yeah. Well, well, we both are. I think, so. but we're yeah. we're. I think we're fortunate in that sense. Yeah, I love when everybody's saying that they are not working; that they're just enjoying their life, and this is yeah. this is their work. This is what we do as well. Yeah, but I I consider myself still in the lucky category. I mean, I I generally love what I do, but maybe that's in my personality. Maybe that's in my upbringing. I think I would I, whatever I will do, I'll have an extreme passion for, and I I, I love what I do. Joel, what question uh, do you, would you like us to ask our next guest? And unfortunately, we don't provide any context on the, who the next guest is. So it can kind of be anything, uh, any kind of question that, that applies. So no, no, uh, what question would you like us to ask? Yeah, this is tough without knowing uh, who it is. You can ask the craziest question. You know, that's fine. We had, we had some crazy questions. Yeah, we have somebody ask, what, what, what is the shoe size you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah someone said what i forget the exact wording but it was more bizarre than like how do you make the most romantic love or something something of that nature and you know the guest over here is like <laughs> like a, <laughs> so yeah any, any question any question what was your what was your low point in your journey and what was the point where you knew you were going to make it it's a great question i like that i love that actually it's a story to be heard. Well, Joel, thank you so much for this pleasant conversation. Can you please let our audience know what you have going on? I know you have a, a, a book that was also recently published. Please share with our audience uh, any information and where they can find you. Yeah, so I have spent, I don't know, 20 years now putting together one solution, one thing, which is the immunity code. And under that is the way. And it's meant to solve the problem everybody faces over time to keep the body healthy and young. So check it out if you haven't. You can get it. You can get my first book on Amazon, The Immunity Code, um, or what I suggest is get the new one, The Way. Start there. It's much easier to read. And that you can get at veepnutrition.com. And then I have um, our gut reset is there. And then the whole problem around fat loss, I've, I've, I've taken a farther stab at solving that than anybody has, I think, which is through the immune centric fat loss um, program, along with uh, uh, a sister program, which is called beating the beating the weight rebound. So check all that stuff out. Check out my Instagram, real Joel Green. Check out, uh, please check out my, my ex, which is also real Joel Green. I just started that one. And my TikTok, mm, I just okay. started that one. So yeah, check check that out. And um, we have all we have I have massive amounts of free content that I've created. Um, if you go to my Instagram, click on my free content. There is literally enough stuff in there to keep you busy for weeks. There's a sprinting in ninety days, entire program. There's there's the gut reset. It's all free. So check it out. Joel, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, guys. This was cool.